Chapter 52 And All the World a Dream Nasueda laughed as the starry sky spun around her, and she fell tumbling toward a crevice of brilliant white light miles below. Wind tore at her hair, and her shift flapped wildly, the ragged ends of the sleeves snapping like whips. Great big bats, black and dripping, flocked around her, nipping at her wounds with teeth that cut and stabbed and burned like ice. And still she laughed. The crevice widened and the light engulfed her, blinding her for a minute. When her eyes cleared, she found herself standing in the hall of the soothsayer, looking at herself lying strapped to the ash-colored slab. Next to her limp body stood Galbatorix, tall, broad-shouldered, with a shadow where his face ought to be, and a crown of crimson fire upon his head. He turned toward where she was standing and extended a gloved hand. Come, Nasweda, daughter of Ajahad, unbend your pride and pledge your fealty to me, and I shall give you everything you have ever wanted. She uttered a derisive noise and lunged toward him with her hands outstretched. Before she could tear out his throat, the king vanished in a cloud of black mist. "'What I want is to kill you!' she shouted toward the ceiling. The chamber rang with Galbatorix's voice as it emanated from every direction at once. "'Then here you shall stay until you realize the errors of your ways.' Nasueda opened her eyes. She was still on the slab, her wrists and ankles chained down, and the wounds from the burrow grub throbbing as if they had never stopped. She frowned. Had she been unconscious, or had she just been talking with the king? It was so difficult to tell when, in one corner of the chamber, she saw the tip of a thick green vine force its way between the painted tiles, cracking them. More vines appeared next to the first. They poked through the wall from the outside and spread across the floor, covering it in a sea of writhing, snake-like appendages. Watching them crawl toward her, Nasueda began to chuckle. Is this all he can think of? I have stranger dreams nearly every night. As if in response to her scorn, the slab beneath her melted into the floor, and the thrashing tendrils closed over her, wrapping around her limbs and holding them more securely than any chains. Her sight grew dark as the vines atop her multiplied, and the only thing she could hear was the sound of them sliding against one another, a dry, shifting sound, like that of falling sand. The air around her grew thick and hot, and she felt as if she was having trouble breathing. Had she not known that the vines were only an illusion, she might have panicked then. Instead, she spat into the darkness and cursed Galvatorix's name. Not for the first time, nor for the last, she was sure. But she refused to allow him the pleasure of knowing he had unbalanced her. Light. Golden sunbeams streaming across a series of rolling hills, patched with fields and vineyards. She was standing by the edge of a small courtyard, underneath a trellis laden with blooming morning glories, the vines of which seemed uncomfortably familiar. She was wearing a beautiful yellow dress. There was a crystal goblet of wine in her right hand and the musky, cherry taste of wine upon her tongue. A slight breeze was blowing from the west. The air smelled of warmth and comfort and freshly tilled land. "'Ah, there you are,' said a voice behind her, and she turned to see Murtag striding toward her from a grand estate. Like her, he held a goblet of wine. He was dressed in black hose and a doublet of maroon satin, trimmed with golden piping." A gem-encrusted dagger hung from his studded belt. His hair was longer than she remembered, and he appeared relaxed and confident in a way she had not seen before. That, and the light upon his face, made him appear strikingly handsome, noble even. He joined her under the trellis and placed a hand on her bare arm. The gesture seemed casual and intimate. You, minx, abandoning me to Lord Pharos and his interminable stories. It took me half an hour to escape. Then he paused and looked at her closer and his expression became one of concern. "'Are you feeling ill? Your cheeks look gray.' She opened her mouth, but no words came to her. She could not think how to react. Murtag's brow furrowed. "'You had another one of your attacks, didn't you?' "'I... I don't know. I can't remember how I got here, or...' She trailed off as she saw the pain that had appeared in Murtag's eyes, and which he quickly hid. He slid his hand down to the small of her back as... He moved around her to stare out at the hilly landscape. With a swift motion, he drained his goblet. Then, in a low voice, he said, I know how confusing this is for you. It isn't the first time this has happened, but... He took a deep breath and shook his head slightly. What is the last thing you remember 
Term, Aberon, the siege of Sithri, the gift I gave you that night in Eom. A terrible sense of uncertainty overcame her. Urubain, she whispered. The Hall of the Soothsayer. That is my last memory. For an instant, she felt his hand tremble against her back, but his face betrayed no reaction. Urubain, he repeated hoarsely. He looked at her. Nasweda, it's been eight years since you're Urubain. No, she thought. It can't be. And yet everything she saw and felt seemed so real. The motion of Martag's hair as the wind tousled it, the scent of the fields, the touch of her dress against her skin. It all seemed exactly as it should. But if she was actually there, then why hadn't Murtag re- reassured her of it by reaching out to her mind, as he had done before? Had he forgotten? If eight years had elapsed, he might not remember the promise he made to her so long ago in the Hall of the Soothsayer. I, she started to say, and then she heard a woman call out, My lady! She looked over her shoulder and saw a portly maid hurrying down from the estate, the front of her white apron flapping. My lady! said the maid, and curtsied. I'm sorry to disturb you, but the children hoped that you would watch them put on their play for the guests. Children, she whispered. She looked back at Murtag to see his eyes shining with tears. Aye, he said. Children, four of them, all strong and healthy and full of high spirits. She shuddered, overcome with emotion. She could not help it. Then she lifted her chin. Show me what I have forgotten. Show me why I have forgotten. Murtag smiled at her with what seemed like pride. It would be my pleasure, he said, and kissed her on the forehead. He took her goblet and gave both glasses to the maid. Then he grasped her hands in his, closed his eyes, and bowed his head. An instant later, she felt a presence pressing against her mind, and then she knew it was not him. It could never have been him. Angered by the deception and by the loss of what could never be, she pulled her right hand free of Murtag's, grabbed his dagger, and shoved the blade into his side, and she shouted, In El Harim, there lived a man, a man with yellow eyes. To me, he said, Beware the whispers, for they whisper lies. Murtag regarded her with a curiously blank expression, and then he faded away before her. Everything around her, the trellis, the courtyard, the estate, the hills with the vineyards, vanished, and she found herself floating in a void without light or sound. She tried to continue her litany, but no sound came from her throat. She could not even hear the pounding of her pulse in her veins. Then she felt the darkness twist, and... She stumbled and fell onto her hands and knees. Sharp rocks scraped her palms. Blinking as her eyes adjusted to the light, she rose to her feet and looked around. Haze. Ribbons of smoke drifting across a barren field similar to the burning plains. She was once more clothed in her tattered shift, and her feet were bare. Something roared behind her, and she spun around to see a twelve-foot-tall coal charging toward her, swinging an iron-bound club as large as she was. Another roar came from her left, and she saw a second coal, as well as four smaller ergles. Then a pair of cloaked, hunchbacked figures scurried out of the whitish haze and darted in her direction, chittering and waving their leaf-bladed swords. Although she had never seen them before, she knew they were the Razak. She laughed again. Now Gabatorix was just trying to punish her. Ignoring the oncoming enemies, whom she knew she would never be able to kill or escape, she sat cross-legged on the ground and began to hum an old dwarvish tune. Gabatorix's initial attempts to deceive her had been subtle affairs that might very well have succeeded in leading her astray had Murtag not warned her beforehand. To keep Murtag's help a secret, she had pretended to be ignorant of the fact that Gabatorix was manipulating her perception of reality, but regardless of what she saw or felt, She refused to allow the king to trick her into thinking of the things she should not, or, far worse, giving him her loyalty. Defying him had not always been easy, but she held to her rituals of thought and speech, and with them, she had been able to thwart the king. The first illusion had been of another woman, Riala, who joined her in the hall of the soothsayer as a fellow prisoner. The woman claimed she was secretly wedded to one of the Varden's spies in Urobain, and that she had been captured while carrying a message for him. Over what seemed like the course of a week, Riala tried to ingratiate herself with Nasueda, and, in a sideways manner, convinced her that the Varden's campaign was doomed, that their reasons for fighting were flawed, and that it was only right and proper to submit to Galbatorix's authority. In the beginning, Nasueda had not realized that Riala herself was an illusion. She had assumed that Galbatorix was distorting the woman's words or appearance, or perhaps that he was tampering with her own emotions 
to make her more susceptible to Riala's arguments. As the days had dragged on, and Murtag neither visited nor contacted her, she had grown to fear that he had abandoned her to Calvatorix's clutches. The thought caused her more anguish than she would have liked to admit, and she found herself worrying about it at nearly every turn. Then she began to wonder why Galvatorix had not come to torture her during the week, and it occurred to her that if a week had elapsed, then the Varden and the Elves would have attacked Urobane. And if that had happened, Galvatorix surely would have mentioned it, if only to gloat. Moreover, Riala's somewhat odd behavior, combined with a number of inexplicable gaps in her memory, Galvatorix's forbearance, and Murtag's continued silence, for she could not bring herself to believe he would break his word to her, convinced her, as outlandish as it seemed, that Riala was an apparition, and that time was no longer what it seemed. It had shaken her to realize that Galvatorix could alter the number of days she thought had passed. She loathed the, the idea. Her sense of time had grown vague during her imprisonment, but she had retained a general awareness of its passage. To lose that, to become unmoored in time, meant she was even more at Galvatorix's mercy, for he could prolong or contract her experiences as he saw fit. Still, she remained determined to resist Galvatorix's attempts at coercion, no matter how much time seemed to go by. If she had to endure a hundred years in her cell, then a hundred years she would endure. When she had proven immune to Riala's insidious whisperings, and indeed finally denounced the woman for being a coward and a traitor, the figment was taken from her chamber, and Galbatorix moved on to another ploy. Thereafter, his deceptions had grown increasingly elaborate and improbable, but none broke the laws of reason and none conflicted with what he had already shown her, for the king was still trying to keep her ignorant of his meddling. His efforts culminated when he seemed to take her from the chamber to a dungeon cell elsewhere in the citadel, where she saw what appeared to be Aragon and Sephira bound in chains. Galbatorix had threatened to kill Aragon unless she swore fealty to him, the king. When she refused, much to Galbatorix's displeasure, and, she thought, his surprise, Aragon shouted a spell that somehow freed the three of them. After a brief duel, Galbatorix fled, which she doubted he would ever do in reality, and then she, Aragon, and Sephira started to fight their way out of the citadel. It had been rather dashing and exciting, and she had been tempted to find out how the sequence of events would resolve itself but by then she felt she had played along with Galvatorix's false show for long enough. So she seized upon the first discrepancy she noticed, the shape of the scales around Saphir's eyes, and used it as an excuse to feign a realization that the world around her was only a pretense. "'You promised you would not lie to me while I was in the hall of the soothsayer!' she had shouted into the air. "'What is this but a lie, oathbreaker?' Galvatorix's wrath at her discovery had been prodigious. She had heard a growl like that of a mountain-sized dragon, and then he had abandoned all subtlety, and for the rest of the session he subjected her to a series of fantastical torments. At last the apparitions had ceased, and Murtag had contacted her to let her know she could once again trust her senses. She had never been so happy to feel the touch of his mind. That night he had come to her, and they spent hours sitting together and talking. He told her of the Varden's progress. They were nearly upon the capital and of the Empire's preparations, and he explained that he believed he had discovered a means of freeing her. When she pressed him for details, he refused to elaborate, saying, I need another day or two to see if it will work, but there is a way, Nasueda. Take heart in that. She had taken heart in his earnestness and his concern for her. Even if she never escaped, she was glad to know that she was not alone in her captivity. After she recounted some of the things Galbatorix had done to her and the means by which she had foiled him, Murtag chuckled. You've proven more of a challenge than he anticipated. It's been a long time since anyone has given him this much of a fight. I certainly didn't. I understand little about it, but I know it's incredibly difficult to create believable illusions. Any competent magician can make it seem as if you're floating in the sky, or that you're cold or hot, or that there's a flower growing in front of you. Small, complicated things, or large, simple things, are the most any one person can hope to create, and it requires a great deal of concentration to maintain the illusion. If your attention wavers, all of a sudden the flower has four petals instead of ten, or it might vanish altogether. Details are the hardest thing to replicate. Nature is filled with infinite details, but our minds can only hold so much. If you're ever in doubt as to whether what you're seeing is real, look at the details. Look for the seams in the world, where the spellcaster either does not know, or has forgotten what should be there, or has taken a shortcut to conserve energy. If it's so difficult... Then how does Galbatorix manage it? He's using the Eldenari, 
All of them? Murtek nodded. They provide the energy and the details needed, and he directs them as he wants. So then, the things I see are built on the memories of dragons? She asked, feeling slightly awed. He nodded again. That and the memories of their riders, for those who had riders. The following morning, Murtag had woken her with a swift bolt of thought to tell her that Galbatorix was about to start again. Thereafter, phantoms and illusions of every sort had beset her, but as the day wore on, she noticed that the visions, with a few notable exceptions, such as that as Murtag and her at the estate, had grown increasingly fuzzy and simple, as if either Galbatorix or the Eldunari were growing tired. And now she sat upon the barren plain, humming a dwarven tune as Cole, Urgles, and Razak bore down on her. They caught her, and it felt as if they cut and beat her, and at times she screamed and wished her pain would end, but not once did she consider giving in to Galbatorix's desires. Then the plain vanished, as did most of her suffering, and she reminded herself, It is only in my mind. I shall not give in. I am not an animal. I am stronger than the weakness of my flesh. A dark cave lit by glowing green mushrooms appeared around her. For several minutes, she heard a large creature snuffling and patting about in the shadows between the stalagmites, and then she felt the creature's warm breath against the back of her neck, and she smelled the odor of carrion. She started to laugh again, and she continued to laugh even as Galatorx forced her to confront horror after horror in an attempt to find the particular combination of pain and fear that would break her. She laughed because she knew her will was stronger than his imagination, and she laughed because she knew she could count on Murtag's help. And with him as her ally, she did not fear the spectral nightmares Galbatorix inflicted upon her, no matter how terrible they seemed at the time.